Hello, everyone. Welcome to Achieving Success with Olivia Akin. I'm your host, Olivia Akin. Each week, we will discuss the roadmap of achieving your personal and professional success. We will give you real life stories on growing personally and professionally to achieve your life and career goals with the help of some top notch guests. Today, we are speaking with Jen Nash. Jen is the founder of Jen Nash Shift. Jen Nash Shift is brought into or your organization to give keynote speeches, help with training and strategy. Jen is also a published author of the book, The Big Power of Tiny Connections. You can find Jen on LinkedIn by searching Jen Nash or by emailing her at jen at jennash.com. Hello, Jen. It's fantastic having you on the show today. Thank you, Olivia. It is awesome to be here. Haven't I, seen the sun in five days, and so I'm feeling like in a really good mood. Sun came out today. I was like, strong debut. I I feel the same way. I got home from a trip, and for three days, it's been just cloudy and rain. And I'm like, I would be nice to look out the window and at least see some sun. <laughs> you know, but fall's hitting, so I'm like, it's... The rain is better than snow, at least. We're not there yet. Um, but <laughs> I'll take I'll take it. So to start off the show, can you tell me what success means and looks like to Jen Nash? Ooh, fun question straight out of the bat. Good one, Olivia. Um, so I'm gonna flip this on its head and probably answer in a bit of an, a wacky way. Success to me is freedom. Success to me is choices. Success to me is conscious choices. Like you get to structure your day in a way that really aligns with your joy. So um, I remember reading a quote that I think nails it. Success to me is being as busy as I want to be. What I love about that quote is it's also saying not as busy as I want to be. You know what I mean? Like I think if I if someone was like, can you give me the definition of success in under three words? I think I would just say naps and choices. <laughs> naps are amazing. I am a big proponent of naps, whether it's that 15 minute quick a nap or that three hours. Sometimes we need a nap and the power of the nap can be really helpful. And I think we forget sometimes too, as an adult, the power that a nap can hold. And there should be no shame in the nap game. Okay. <laughs> I love that. That's a t-shirt. No shame in the nap game. You heard it here first, people. Yeah. Um, no, I think on the contrary. I actually love that the concept of slaying and crushing it and working 17 hours a day is kind of in the rear. Thank you, COVID. You know, people got so worn out, they realized they can't lose their joy. And I think naps are one of those things where I feel like naps are becoming a flex. Like now when people say, oh, I had a nap. Like everybody else goes, oh, Shazam. And I'm like, I got eight hours of sleep last night. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and that's the thing. And you brought it up in your what success looks like to you right now is the power of deciding your busyness. And I think within that, there's a big chunk of that, of understanding the power of no and yes and what fits you in that moment. And it can change you know right now for me I've started I'm in a period of my life too right now just with so many things going on and obligations I have in my personal life that when certain meetings come up for organizations nonprofits that I run and they're like Olivia just come to the meeting we want you at the meeting and I'm like I take a step back and before I just be like okay it's a nighttime meeting I can join for the hour and now I'm going no like you I've done that for a year now and I'm sitting here going every time I do it I'm just sit I'm sitting there just to make you feel like you you have someone else at the table where it also and I have had this conversation with this specific individual because it's a collaboration of multiple nonprofit chapters of when you have two presidents sitting in a meeting 
and you're trying to direct the dialogue straight to me. And I have very competent people who can do the job, who are in the role to do the job, and you're trying to turn everything to me to answer. I'm now not allowing my people who are amazing individuals take the lead and flourish as well. So sometimes when you decide that, okay, how busy do I really want to be? And even sometimes delegating those things. And when others are like, wait, no, we just want you here. It's like, no, I don't need to be here. And that's okay. And that shift and transition can be hard. And but sometimes it needs to be done. Absolutely. Wow. This is like landing spot on. So um, I'm a coach and I coach executives. And one of my executives is a managing director at an investment bank, and they are very overwhelmed all the time. And so that's actually one of the things we've been focusing on. They're overwhelmed. And I literally got an email from my coach and it was um, all about when we say yes, what are we actually saying no to? And my coach, Allison Graham, who's um, out of Canada and she's awesome. She literally said, next time you say yes, and I want you to think about this, Olivia, next time you say yes to something, especially something that you got guilted into or pushed into, and instead of responding, I'll get back to you so you could really check in with yourself and you just say yes, I want you to picture having to say no to family, close friends, that really big project, that really big nonprofit that you really wanted to spend time with. And I think when you visualize, for instance, like having to look into the eyes of your child and say, I'd love to spend time with you, kiddo, but I said yes to this thing that I didn't really want to do because I felt obliged to do this unimportant task. And it's more important than my relationship with you. Like picture what that little kid's face is going to do because that's the truth of the moment. So if you can't picture saying no to something important, you should definitely not be saying yes. And I, and I love that aspect. And it's really true because when you say yes to something, if something else comes up, right? I always use the analogy of in the summertime, I have a big rule. No meetings after 5 p.m. I do not care. My nonprofit that I run or I sit on boards on, I'm like, we don't need summer meetings. If we get things done in the fall and winter, great. And we typically do because we plan months ahead of time. And I'm like, there's no need for summer meetings. If people want to touch base with each other and connect, that's one thing. And you can do that on your own time. But to take up someone's night in the summer when it's warm and you can go out and do things, I'm like, and I love summertime. I love the warm weather. So for me, I go, winter, it's more understandable. People are going to be home. They're in the house. Okay. They might want to have that connection as well. Summertime, no. And that's, it's setting those boundaries. But and also to your point, I just had a conversation with someone, the same organization, actually. There's, we host an event once a month and it's virtual. and. My boyfriend had got a invite to a wedding and he was like, will you come to the wedding? And it just so happened that I have to travel for this wedding. So I will be out of the country. And so I was like, yeah, sure, we'll go. And it aligns the same night at the trip, one of the nights it aligns. And so I had the conversation of I can't attend this event. You have a speaker. It's just, you know, I don't need to sit there. And they're like, well, and I'm like, listen, I'm going to be away. I have an obligation that I committed to. Um, And so I can't. And they're like, well, you can join from the wedding. And I'm like, no, that's not how this goes. And I think sometimes we ease into conversations because we don't want to totally let someone down. But then the message doesn't get perceived of everything is important. But right now where you stand, the priority is shifting. And in the moment, we have to rank those priorities. Yeah, I totally hear that. Agreed. Jen, you worked for two decades in Fortune 50 companies. 
What made you leave the corporate world? And what was that journey like to starting your own business? Um, so I was a consultant for 20, 25 years. And my background is I worked for amazing ad agencies. You've probably heard of some of them, Ogilvy, JWT, um, Wonderman, Havas, Publicis. I've worked for lots of them, Saatchi and Saatchi. And I got to work with amazing clients, like the best of the best from Adobe and Citibank to TVA um, and IBM, like Hershey Company, like super fun stuff um, and super interesting stuff. And I did all of that while I was actually running um, uh, a real estate investment company for myself as well as as a um I mean, I don't know if you can call it a side hustle because it took up all my summers, but <laughs> summer weekends. But um, so I was very used to balancing um, different needs and time structures. And so I just hit a wall. My mom died about seven years ago and I hit a wall. I had about a year left of work to do because I promised my team I wouldn't I wouldn't take any time off after she died. So I took time off a year later and I just kind of realized I didn't want to go back into the agency world full time because you kind of feel like they own your seat. Like your ass needs to be in that chair on their terms. Um, I think the world is a bit different right now, thanks to COVID. You know, now ad agencies are lucky if they can get their teams in two to three times a week. Like people are really pushing back. But the transition... The transition was a lot harder because I kept thinking, oh, it's going to be the same becoming a vendor as it is being a consultant. It's completely different. So that was really unusual for me because it took that was a slow wake up call because as a consultant, they bring you in immediately. As soon as the RFP is signed, they have money. They want you to start work. They have deliverables. As a vendor, they can get to you whenever they want to get to you, and maybe they're never given get get to you, right? So you get put off, put off. So it's a completely different follow up game that, frankly, I still haven't mastered. I'm working on it, but you know, it's challenging. So that shift has been and is, you know, one of awakenings. And I think you brought up an important part there of. As the shift is happening, you're seeing different sides of things and it's a different game. It isn't always that smooth transition and there's skills that you then have to master. And like you said, you haven't mastered. And I think one thing that people forget about as businesses are growing and the idea of starting their business is the follow-up can look completely different. And those reach outs and what you need to say can be completely different than how you're used to writing them or approaching a situation. And that can be hard to transition into because sometimes, too, it's the thought process of, like, if I don't nail this email and, like, get them to bring me on or hire me, then I'm losing money. I am. That is my livelihood. Whereas sometimes when you're a consultant within an organization or an employee, you know your your check is coming. So there's also that different level, I think, of stress that doesn't get talked about sometimes of everyone gets to the reach outs, right? Those cold emails, whatever it might be. But there is someone on the other side, especially if it's a smaller business starting out, that is really doing that for genuine purposes, but also because that's their livelihood right now. Yeah, and I agree. I think it's um, it's a different kind of stress. And honestly, it's one that I kind of inoculated myself against to some degree for the good and the bad of it, because I created a passive income stream through having real estate. So being able to transition, I mean, it's no different than, say, if I was married and my husband was paying my bills, right? Or my partner was paying my bills. Um, let's keep it gender neutral. Um <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm all for it. But like if someone has a partner that's like going to support them shifting, you know, jobs, that's phenomenal. And I think, you know, lots of people are in that space and that gives them the headspace to just take the steps they need to do. But eventually you're right. Like eventually you're going to like 
I think for me, the big question is, like, at what point will I get back to earning the kind of money that I earned in corporate, right? How many years is that going to take? Is it even possible? I believe it is based on projections, but I think it's a lot slower. But I just went to an amazing retreat called the Modern Elder Academy in Baja, Mexico, which is founded by um, Christine Sperber and Chip Connolly. And Chip Connolly is like, proof that posting on LinkedIn drives results. The man posts daily and his posts are fascinating. And he reminded me in this retreat that you get to a point in midlife where you start over. Most people do. Like they hit a point and they're like, I don't want to do that anymore. Like I don't like I know creative directors who are in their 50s and they've been huge, huge leaders in the ad world and the marketing world. And they're becoming coaches like me or real estate agents or they're starting film companies like you know the passion calls and the thing is is we have to remember we got 30 40 years left like why would we want to do the same thing endlessly you know you're just not going to stay as engaged it's not possible our brains constantly want to grow and shift and learn so i think we have to cut ourselves some slack when we want to shift things up. So normal and it's so healthy. And yeah, it's not easy. And I remember too, you brought up the point in the beginning of, you know, the mindset of when you leave corporate, especially corporation, whether it's small or, you know, that Fortune 50 company, that you're getting a certain salary and you've grown accustomed to that salary. And then going on your own and you sit there and are like, well, wow, okay. Now I've re- now I have to check myself on some things. Um, and also where do the priorities lay and like, okay, do I need to be doing this? Because I've been doing it for a few years, but now money is tighter. And I think it is I went through that when I left corporate and I started my, or I started my business full time because I had already started it, but then I decided to focus on it. And I am a human being that does the multiple jobs at once, like yourself, person who has the passive income sometimes, and I, and I take charge of those opportunities. But for me, when I leaned into this, I was like a big chunk of my time has to go through this. But then I was sitting there going, oh, after like a few months, it took a few months. But after a few months, I was like, oh, that salary, that that not dollar amount, knowing it was hitting versus now having the feeling of it all lies on your shoulders and when are you going to get back to that point and it's you have to remind yourself like you said the projections you're not going to start a business and i've reminded myself this you're not starting a business and out the gate making a hundred thousand dollars in a month or if you were making five thousand dollars at your job i'm just throwing an arbitrary number out there but if you were making five thousand dollars a month at your job, you're not going to start your business in the first month necessarily bring that in, but that's okay. Because if you create a good foundation, like these bigger organizations that you were hired at, you then are able to grow and build upon that. And I think that's the important thing to remember as well. And like you said, it's also the aspect of being true to yourself and what you're good with and your passion. I think a lot of us, especially when you're younger, forget that you can follow your passion and it is okay to change roles. It's okay to change companies. Just because you sign on a dotted line does not mean that is your end all be all. Um, And it is also okay and acceptable to start to learn skills in different areas with even within your industry just to learn them. Yeah, I would agree with that. And I'm curious, like, where do you hear the most questions from your audience? Like, is there a vertical around, like, shifting? Or is there a, one stream of question that applies to sort of this conversation that you hear a lot? So I think a big question that I get a lot is people's journeys and how they don't understand the uncomfortableness until they really start transitioning or asking for things, right? You and I have talked about how you really work with 
you've worked with people on salary negotiations and finding your voice and power in that. And there's this idea that that's not always acceptable or how to look at it and approach it in general. So I think something that would be great for our listeners to also hear about is your approach on salary negotiations, your ideas on the topic, because I feel like there's a big idea that when a company you get hired by a job gives you that number you got to take it and it's the number that you're looking at and not all the other moving pieces that those are, can all be used and leveraged to get what you're looking for in your job yeah it's it's fascinating i'm so passionate about this whole conversation i actually put out um a salary salary negotiation workbook a couple of years ago, which is still on my website for it's like 15 bucks. It's so worth it because it actually makes you do a bunch of questions and research so that you really can figure out what it should be. Because you're right, people get fixated on the number and it's really just an arbitrary number. So I always tell people, go and ask five men and five women that do this job, what's their salary? And a lot of people are like, no one's going to tell me. But I'm like, of course they will. You say, hey, what does someone, you know, with your experience and job title make, give or take? What's the average range? And they're going to give you a range. Like, and their job, their their salary is probably going to be within the range they're sharing, right? Because they're not telling you that they make exactly $115.7,000. But, you know, give or take, they're going to say the range is 110 to 125, right? Great, but get that number from men and women because it will vary. Women still only make 81 cents on the dollar if they're Asian um, and 79 cents if they're white and 66 cents if they're Latin or African-American. It's insane. We haven't moved the wage gap one iota in the last 10 years, which is interesting because I, for one, have seen so much around women educating women around how to ask for more, how to get a raise, because we are leaving so much money on the table by just taking the number. And even when you negotiate for 10% more, I think a lot of people are like, oh, it's only five grand if you're at like, you know, 50,000. But that 10 grand when you're at 100,000 compounded, you know, and I love the fact that New York State no longer allows people to ask, what are you making now? It's an illegal question. They are not allowed to ask. And the thing is, it doesn't mean anything because what you're making now has no relationship to what you should make in the new job because we don't know what the job description is. You know, we don't know if you're going to get um, bonus based on referrals or sales or anything like that. You could literally triple your salary in one step. Totally OK. And I think we forget that. We think it's like this little incremental thing where we're inching up a scale. Doesn't have to be. And the power of the ask and the negotiation, I think, is so important, too. And we've seen it, especially in young professionals. They get scared to like, OK, that's the number. And if I go and ask, then it can just all get taken away. And I'd rather just take the number than lose the opportunity. But how do you try to help people have those conversations about going in to a boss or a potential company and say, no, I want I want to change this number. This is what I'm thinking. And what what advice would you give? Um, well, for starters, you will never lose a job offer. If they have actually offered you the job and they've given you a, a written offer, you're not going to lose the job because you negotiate. I have interviewed so many HR people, and the only time they've ever rescinded a job offer is someone got rude or cocky or showed them, you know, just a not nice side of themselves, right? So it's totally expected and okay to negotiate. Best way to do it is do not say thank you for the job offer. And I, I talk about this in the, uh, in, the, in the guidebook that I have on this. Like, do not say thank you because that implies that you've reached a good point. So when they say, we'd like to offer you this job at $100,000 a year, you say, that's a great start. Um, let me get back to you. Um, and so then what you're going to do, hopefully you've been doing it up until the point because you had an idea. I wouldn't spend any time interviewing for a job when you don't know what they're going to pay. And a lot of people do. I'm like, you're wasting your time. 
So you would do your research and then you would call them back and do it on the phone, even though it's very uncomfortable. I encourage you to practice with your friends and your family. Um, but basically you call them back and you say, listen, I've done a lot of research and based on the job description, the title and the fact that I have seven years of experience and was highlighted for X, Y, and Z and got these awards, I believe that my salary should be between 117 and 228. Now, most likely they're going to pick the bottom number. So whatever your bottom number is, you better be delighted with it right? Now you're giving them a range as a courtesy. It's possible they'll say, great, we'd like to offer you 120. We can do that because they you, they just gave you a 10 grand bump, right? Most companies expect people, especially men, to negotiate. So there's usually a little padding in there and we don't go and get it typically. We just don't. We're like the number's the number. So I think that's a really good start. Be bold, do your research, Say, do not say thank you when they make the offer. And when you loop around, you know, really lay into your research and the reasons supporting why you should get more and have these conversations. Dare to be brave. Have these conversations, even though they're uncomfortable. I love how you say have it over the phone. And even though it's going to be uncomfortable, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes we have to approach the uncomfortable head on. And I think a lot of people because they don't want to have that uncomfortable, email is easy. Er, I should say, it's easier to have. But there's tone that plays into emails that could end up hindering your conversation or be perceived wrong. And then you're building a relationship out the gate with all pure intentions. But now they're having a perception of you that when you do start is already hindered based on the email correspondence that yeah. you had. Also, what's easier to say no to, an email or a person on the phone? Like, an email. Mm -hmm. Like, she wants to say no, because HRs are usually female. Like, they want to say no, they're going to say no so much easier. But request a phone call and do your talk. This, I mean, the thing is, I don't understand. Like, we are fighting for our worth, and it is hard. But I think when we nail this, we nail it in other aspects of our lives. And, you know, I, by no stretch of the imagination, am an expert. I failed and failed and failed. So this is how I like did a bunch of research and really started to understand what am I doing wrong? And it's funny because, you know, I have lots of friends and they're like, how could you possibly fail? You're so bold. You're so out there. And I'm like, I thought the number was the number for years. I just assumed and I want the job. So I take it. But the thing is, is I then found out that I could have been being paid a lot more. Yeah. So fight for you. Fight for you is what I say. For you as well, and you kind of brought this up, it's not always just the number, but it's the other things you have to look at. So what in conversations you've had with individuals, what are some of those things do you think are most common that people forget play into what that number could really end up being, whether that's other kind of benefits, time off, you know, things. Yeah, you have to look at what's important to you because what's important to you at 40 isn't going to be the same thing that's important to you at 28. At 40, you're more likely to want flexibility of schedule because you might have kids. You're going to want um, any kind of matching. At 28, you should care. Do they have a 401k match? Like you should absolutely be running the benefits. And there's different websites that actually will compare benefit offers one to another. Do they have dental? Do they have eye? Do they just offer medical? You know, that's all going to play in more when you're 40 versus when you're 28 and you really don't care because your eyes are kick-ass. But, you know, um, I think all of that plays in. But for me, it's really fascinating. The stuff that I cared about was like, what's the 401k match? Um, what are the like, what are the perceived hours? What's the culture like? Um, and can I get a, a window seat? Like, I really need light. I need to be around light. And that really helps me be the best I can be at work. And so I would often ask to get in my offer letter that my desk would be proximitous to a window. And they're usually happy to do that, you know, like stuff like that. But for some people, it could be a parking spot not too far away, you know, because they always have heavy bags and they don't want to lug it. 
But I think it's really personal, you know? And I love how you brought up you can add those things into your offer letter so that even if sometimes in any kind of negotiation or conversation, something gets said and then it's like, oh, well, that wasn't in writing. I have no recollection, right? And that could be personal, professional. If I'm going to use wedding vendors as an example, if you go to a venue and then a certain number is in the contract and you don't have that number, you're like, well, I don't remember agreeing to shift this down because it wasn't edited in the contract. And so sometimes putting those things that make you happier um, or more comfortable in life and will just make you grow and be successful is important. And it's important to you. So remember to put it in that contract. And it's okay. You know, the small things people forget can be just as powerful, even though there's not necessarily a dollar amount tied to having a desk by a window versus not having it. But it will make you perform better. And that's also ultimately what the company wants. Yeah, totally agree. Yeah. Jen, if you could give one piece of advice to someone who has been in their career and is like, I'm, I want to go back and have the conversation about salary negotiations. I don't know how to approach it because I've already been in the company and I've been there for a while and I've kind of just avoided it up to this point. How would you advise someone to go about that? Great question. I actually just gave this advice to one of my coaching clients. So figure out what your salary should be. Do your due diligence, do your research and say you're at a hundred and you know that you've been there for a year and a half um, and you're ready to take the next step and you really want to be making 125. You go to your boss and you say, what are the steps that I need to take so that I can get a pay raise. I want to be at 125 in the next three months. And your boss is going to say, here's the list of things to do. Or they're going to say that's absolutely not possible. Or they're going to tell you to go talk to HR. They're going to tell you a whole bunch of things. But you're going to come back and say, I need a roadmap. Work with me on this. And if they say no, well, guess what? Congrats. You're looking for a new job because they're not going to be supportive of where you need to be. Um, but most likely, they're going to start working with you on a roadmap. And it may not be three months. It may be six months. But I always encourage you to keep the window short because, of course, they're going to make it six months, right? They want you working for as little as possible for as long as possible. Um, it is a corporation after all. But at the same time, now you've actually raised your hand. Now they know what's important to you, right? Right. So imagine if you actually did get your list, you nail your list, and three months later, you go back in and you say, I've hit all of this. Um, you know, let's get that raise on board. And they're going to say, oh, fantastic. You know, ho hopefully. Um, I mean, I certainly, I would expect people with integrity to honor that. But I think that answers your question. No, it totally does. And I think I love the part where you brought up the roadmap and identifying that with the manager. But it's also can be so telling that when you go to the table and say, this is my goals, this is where I want to be. Can we work together to get there? And they say no or shut you down. That's also writing on the wall and how they value you as an employee or whether there is that growth potential, whether it's that three month or six month, or whether they're going to potentially advocate for you because they're telling you kind of in that moment, their views as well. I'm going to the last question I want to discuss today, which is similar to the one I just asked, but it's flipping it to that young professional who's not as experienced, just out the gate, and it's their first time negotiating a salary. What advice would you give to them so that they know it's comfortable to go through this process and what to kind of look out for when they're trying to advocate for themselves? Yeah, I mean, it's it's. It's interesting because I have given talks about salary negotiation to college kids who are graduating and 50% of them are absolutely not even going to bother, right? They're leaving any potential money hidden in a drawer in that person's office. But the other 50, you know, they really understand that this is a game, right? And so, you know, I think the advice is, again, you've got to research, 
Doesn't matter that you're just out of college. Doesn't matter that you have no experience. Did you go to a good college? What other qualifications that 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 have led you to this point could you reference when you're talking to the HR or the hiring manager? Because a lot of the times, if the hiring manager really likes you, they're going to advocate hard for you with HR. So whoever is making the decisions, they do have power, right? Because they're not going to want you to walk after they make you an offer. So say you get the offer at 55 and you've done your research and you know you really should be getting 64. It's not that big of a deal. And a lot of people would be like, oh, whatever. But again, you got to look at it as compound, right? So that that $9,000 you're leaving on the table is going to impact you long term. So also that's like, you know, $700 a month before taxes. That can go a long way. That's 500 bucks after taxes. Think about what we could do with that. Um, So I strongly encourage them to do their research and then also look through your entire job history. You know, did you work and manage, say, an ice cream store in high school, right? Mm -hmm. Like, did you show up consistently? Were you reliable? Did you go above and beyond? Did you make posters for the ice cream shop? Did you actually handle social media marketing? Did you support the owner just in really unique three-dimensional ways? Bring your past experience, even though it may not seem like corporate experience, into play as a candidate because it actually underscores who you are and how you show up and that they should pay you more, right? And also remember, it really is a game. So be friendly, be polite, be sincere, but advocate for yourself because no one else is going to do it. I love that. And it is so true and so important to remember to advocate for yourself, but also be able to pull those past experiences, even if they don't seem like the typical experiences in general that would align with a certain job or an industry. You know, I talk a lot with athletes about and their transition into play after they're done playing, whether it's in college or pro. And I always say I get a lot of the, well, I'm done playing football and all my passion up to this point is football. And I've that's where all my time has gone. And football doesn't transcend into this area of what I'm going to be doing next. And so I have no experience. And I'm like, wait, time management leading how you, you know, look at situations and approach diverse areas. And then the light bulb starts going off. So even though, like you said, with the ice cream shop, it might not be that typical way that an in, in industry or job you're taking now is perceiving roles, but there's tools you've learned in them and experiences you've had that you can leverage and that you're bringing to the table because of your background and past experiences as well. Jen, how can people get in touch with you if they would like to connect with you? I am on Insta. I am real Jen Nash. And my website is just jennash.com. And you nailed my email, jen at jennash.com. So I feel like that's a solid contact sphere. Thank you, Jen, for all of your insight today. Oh, you're so welcome. I'm excited to like support you and support your listeners. Great questions. Thank you. And I love them because I am also very passionate about bringing awareness to salary negotiations and really leveraging and elevating yourself through your voice. But also it all adds up, right? Like you said throughout this show, it's about putting the time in, understanding your value, the research that goes into it but also having the ability to use your voice to get what you want and having those uncomfortable conversations. A few of our key takeaways from today's conversation are when you say yes to something, you're also saying no. So are you going to be okay to saying no to something else when you're saying that yes? Like Jen said, if it's that thing that you're just feeling obligated to do, think about, am I going to be able to turn to someone who's important to me and say to them, I didn't really have to do that, but I just did it because, and so now something else is being affected, as well as go and scare peers about their salary range. I think we've had this idea that asking about money is not okay, but 
ask about the range because that'll give you an idea without putting someone else in necessarily an uncomfortable position because it is the range. And like Jen said, it'll give you the idea because typically their number is within that range. As well as, do you not say thank you for the job offering? Said, say that it is a good start and I will give, get back to you. It allows you to take the time to process the number, process what you really want without necessarily diving right into it or making it seem that you overappreciate it because now you're giving them the leverage while also t- making sure your emotions aren't getting too involved. You have the ability to do that research as well as have the mindset that salary negotiations is a game. And I love that that Jen said, if you view it as a game and you're playing a game, we all like to win games, right? So use it as a game and understand that each side is going to play it and you just have to be able to play it well, but also play it ethically to yourself and what you really want and what's important to you. And the last and most important that Jen said consistently today, research, research, research. Do your research and be prepared. And when you take the emotion out of it and you come to the table with factual information and data, it makes you look more valid. It makes the conversation more factual. And then you know when the conversation's pivoting what you really can be doing with that. This was a great episode with our top-notch guest, Jen Nash. Thank you for listening and have a successful day.